Thanks everyone for joining us on this webinar series today. Uh, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon, good night. I can see here the list of attendees is growing. We have people from South America, uh, Europeans from Portugal. Boa tarde, boa noite. Uh, so just a, a quick note here. The, the, our MRL facilities are actually the lab spaces is still closed until April the 30th but we are fully operating online. We are still offering like support from the staff uh, in terms of answering your questions and helping you with your research. If you are uh, never been a user of the facilities, it's a good time now to submit a proposal because we're still, uh, we're still processing and accepting those proposals. So uh, the, the MRL webinar series is running now every Thursday at noon time. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of upcoming talks. Uh, the MRL is also participating in another uh, webinar series that involves four different facilities across the country. Penn State University, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and the University of Minnesota. And we have another series going on there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11 a.m. Central Time. In fact, many of our staff in the MRL will be speaking that series as well. So if I can uh, get you moved to the next slide, huh, we please? Yes, so as you can see here that the, we have a, a, a list of upcoming talks. Uh, next week is gonna be about XPS, S, uh, then the SIMS, the 3D optical profiler, and then we come back with like analytical SEM. Uh, I think today's speaker will also come back in a few weeks talk about FIB. Uh, uh, as well. So for the Zoom session today, we ask you to type your questions in the chat box that's under the, typically will show up under the, at the bottom of the screen. If it doesn't show, you can move your mouse there. Uh, in case when, when someone types a question, if the bar shows up and it's distracting you, you can always you know, click on the chat box to acknowledge that. And then that should actually go away for a, for a while. Questions about like video and slides availability. We are recording a video of this uh, presentation. Uh, if, the qual if the presenter decides that the quality is good enough, we'll post it in our uh, YouTube channel or other online uh, resources. The slides, uh, you recommend you to contact the presenter directly. We have a, we'll show an email, a contact email at the end of the presentation where you can actually discuss and send a presentation, uh, get the presentation PDF form if it's the, the presenter decides to do that. So with no more delays, I would like to actually introduce today Dr. Honghui Zhou. Uh, she is actually, she got her uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree at the University of Science and Technology in Beijing, China. And then she got her PhD in material science at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Uh, before joining the MRL in 2012, uh, Dr. Zhou at it held uh, positions, academic positions and research positions, uh, first at the Los Alamos National Lab uh, with the Superconductivity Technology Center, and then afterwards at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory within the Electron Microscopy Group. So Han Hui has been with us in MRL since 2012, a member of the Electron Microscopy team, and she has expertise, expands way beyond SEM, but TEM, analytical techniques, uh, STEM, and she has a particular research interest as well in PLD, post laser deposition uh, technique. So without any further delay, I'll actually would like to welcome uh, Han Wei. Thank you very much, Han Hui, for taking the time to give this presentation on one of the most popular and uh, one of the most sought techniques that we have actually in our lab, which is the scanning electron microscopy. So I give you the word now, Hanwei, and thanks again for taking the time to do that. Thank you, Mara. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to this advanced scanning electron microscopy webinar. So I suppose some of you are our MRL ICM users, so therefore have completed our ICM orientation. Uh, which means you already know the basics of SEM. So this is more like about advanced scanning electron microscopy imaging. 
The focus is this webinar is to introduce a few advanced SEM imaging techniques that are available here but may not be well known to our users uh, so that our users can take a full advantage of the instruments available here at MRL. So before we start, let's get a quick um, look uh, at how the SEM works. So first, there will be an electron probe formed. Then the probe will be scanned across uh, a surface of the sample in a rest pattern. Various signals will be generated and later be detected and analyzed. So the focus of this webinar is on the signal generation and uh, detection. We are going to cover four, uh, four topics. So the first one is ultra high resolution imaging with immersion mirrors, uh, lens and through the lens detector TLD. So to get a high, ultra high resolution ICM imaging, of course, first we will need a very fine probe. And it's clear, uh, uh, it's clear that there's no way to image a fine feature with a huge probe. So we need a fine probe first. To get a fine probe, uh, we will need first a good electron source, so which means it should have a high brightness so that it can deliver uh, more electrons in a small probe. And also it should have a small energy spread so that there will be less uh, chromatic uh, effect. So based on these two, uh, we, 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 we can see that the SEM with a field emission source is better than the SEM with thermionic source. Uh, the other thing we need is a good electron optical system so that a fine, the fine probe can be formed and then manipulated in a proper way. Assuming we have a fine probe, but that's not enough. Uh, because the beam does not stop at the surface. So the electron from the beam does interact with the uh, specimen atoms um, <coughs> through the interaction. And this, this interaction that it does not occur at one, at one point. It's actually through a, a volume of the sample. Uh, through the interaction, the signals generated and get out of the uh, specimen be detected to form the image. So, so that's the reason the, the image resolution is not only limited by uh, the probe size, it's also limited by the interaction volume. So the interaction volume here um, depends on the electron beam energy. So from this simulation, we can see that as the uh, accelerating voltage increase from 5 kV uh, to 25 kV, uh, on a titanium sample, uh, the interaction volume increases dramatically. Um, interaction volume also depends on <coughs> specimen composition density. So here we have a light, relatively light element aluminum and uh, go to higher atomic number tungsten. So we can see that the interaction volume uh, decreases quickly as the atomic number increases. So the uh, interaction volume does uh, limit the spati uh, spatial resolution uh, a lot. So once the um, incident beam electron enters the specimen surface, there will be uh, multiple different types of scattering events. During these scattering events, there will be various signals. So uh, the two signals which are relevant to SEM imaging are the secondary electrons and backscatter electrons, which will be the focus of this uh, webinar. Uh, the rest of the signal will be covered in our analytical SEM webinar, which is coming soon, sometime in May. So let's take a quick review on secondary electron and the backscatter electron. Secondary electron is uh, generated as a result of the interaction uh, elect uh, between the incident beam electron and uh, the uh, specimen uh, atom. So the energy of secondary electron by arbit arbitrary definition is very low, uh, below 50 eV. 
the backscatter electron are the electrons from primary beam. Uh, they are scattered back out of the sample. So the energy distribution of backscatter electron is pretty broad. There is a sharp peak uh, near the incident beam energy and also a continuum of uh, backscatter electron uh, due to inelastic uh, scattering. So the reason we can see a feature in the image is due to the contrast of the image. Uh, the sec uh, SEM image contrast comes from uh, the, the electron yield as well as the detector deficient, uh, <coughs> efficiency. So the secondary electron we can see here, there is, uh, it has a strong dependence on the specimen surface um, orientation, a tilt angle. And also because secondary electrons have very low energy, so only these secondary electrons uh, be right below the surface can get out to be detected. So secondary electron carries high resolution surface um, structure information. So that's the reason we expect secondary electron image gives us a surface topography to information. The backscatter electron has heavy uh, <coughs> Uh, dependence on the, the atomic number, the specimen material composition. So we can see it increases monotonically with the atomic number. So that's why we expect backscatter electron imaging give us composition contrast. But we will see later, that's not the, the whole story here. So there are three types of uh, secondary electrons. Um, the, first, the first type we call SE1. So SE1 is generated right before uh, the, the, the incident beam electron enters the surface. And SE2 are generated uh, right before the backscatter electron get out of the And of course, there are other, all other secondary electrons generated deep down and these electrons won't be able to get out of the surface uh, contributing to the image, so we can ignore them. But SE1 and SE2 both will be collected by the detector if the detector is positively charged. There is also uh, SE3s. So the SE3 is generated when the uh, energetic backscatter electron get after they get out of the specimen surface, they will hit somewhere inside the chamber, um, say the pole piece or the chamber wall, and generating secondary electrons. And these part of at least these secondary electrons will be collected by the detector. So um, SE1 we call high resolution SE because the, the emission volume diameter of SE1 is, is highly localized, not much bigger than the probe size. But the SE2 we call low resolution SE because the, the emission volume diameter is way bigger than the probe size. SE3 is actually uh, it's highly, I mean, it's not localized at all because it's uh, emitting from everywhere from the chamber. So it just gives a noisy background, background noise. So the traditional secondary electron detector is um, we call ET detector, Everhart Sonic. So it's sitting at the side of the chamber wall. So let's take a look what this ET detector detects. The ET detector not only detects the second SE1 the secondary electron, that's what we want, but also backscattered electrons when they are flying along, um, along this direction, like uh, towards the ET detector. So also indirectly BSE through the SE2 and SE3, because we know SE2 and SE3 are generated by backscatter electrons. So these SE2, SE3, they do carry information that backscatter electron carries. So the image from ET detector is not a pure secondary electron 
it's, it is secondary electron, but there is also backscattered uh, um, electron co contribution carries the information um, uh, in the depths, so which may degrade the spatial resolution. <clears throat> so how can we improve the image resolution uh, from the signal generation and uh, collection point of view? There are possible ways. So the first one is reduce uh, or eliminate contributions from SC3 and the BSE. So reduce the background noise. And this can be done by using immersion lens and through the lens detector. And the other way is to shrink the low resolution SE2 emission volume. Uh, this can be done through using lower voltage. So the basic idea of immersion lens was through the lens detector. The through the lens detector, we call TLD, uh, is sitting inside of this electron column up there. So the ETD is on the side, the TLD, that's the Hitachi calls the, up, the upper detector. So it's, it's inside the, the pole piece. Okay, so when we switch on the, uh, the immersion lens, there will be strong magnetic field projected on the specimen surface. And then the SC2, SC, SC1, SC2 will be confined inside this magnetic field and spiral up through the pole piece to be detected. And this way, SC1, SC2 will, can be collected with a very high efficiency, especially when you use a very short working distance. And the SE3 and the BSE are excluded from the TLD detection uh, because the SE3 is, uh, uh, is emitted from uh, other place uh, and they are far off the beam axis, so they are not really affected by the magnetic field. And the BSE has a much higher energy, so they are not affected the same way as the SE1, SE2. The SE3 and the BSE can still be uh, collected separately uh, by the ETD. So let's compare the image taken with TLD and uh, ETD. This is from Hitachi 4800. So we can see the TLD uh, image gives you uh, more uh, surface details. And these surface details uh, we don't see in the image taken by ETD. So the reason is the TLD effectively collects SE1, SE2, and the ETD gives you, uh, you have the contribution from SE3 and the BSE. So let's move to the next topic, low voltage imaging and the beam uh, deceleration. Why low voltage imaging? So as we see earlier, the, the SE3 and the BSE can be eliminated by using TLD uh, in immersion mode. We just talked about it. This significantly de increases the signal noise ratio and enhances the resolution. Uh, but how about SE2? And can we discriminate SE2 as well? Um, unfortunately, um, the detector cannot be made to, to pick up SE1 from uh, SE2 to distinguish SE1. So let's look at this interaction volume, uh, beam energy dependence of the interaction volume again. So we see here when we set the microscope at very high voltage, the uh, interaction volume is big. And then the SE2, they will emit from uh, a very large range of the surface. So that's the reason SE2 will, um, will degrade the surface resolution. But when we reduce the accelerating voltage, therefore the beam energy, the interaction volume uh, shrinks towards the surface. And now the secondary uh, SE2 will emit from much smaller region. At a certain point, SE2 will um, exit from the same volume as the SE1. So this can be uh, this clearly demonstrated from this uh, simulation of spatial distribution of SE1 and SE2 electrons. So we see when the microscope operated at 20 kV, 
the, the sharp SE1P is sitting on a huge base of the SE2. So the high resolution signal SE1 is kind of diluted by the SE2. When we reduce the voltage to 1 kV, now SE1 and SE2 kind of uh, exit from the same volume. So when they, uh, when they exit from the same volume, we can say that SE2 also carries the same high resolution information as SE1. So now it doesn't matter, the, the detector cannot distinguish SE1 from SE2 because SE2 also carries the high resolution uh, information. So this set of image is uh, for a gold particle sample, uh, gold particle, gold plates on a filter paper. And uh, we take an image from 15 kV lower to down to 1 kV. And see at high voltage, we can see that these gold plates are transparent. So we can see clearly the, the particles underneath. And then when we reduce the voltage, we, we can see the gold plates becomes more solid. And then the surface structure starts to become uh, visible. So put this 15 kV, 1 kV image side by side, we can see the difference uh, better. So another benefit from a low voltage imaging is reducing or minimizing the charge effect. So when the incident beam uh, hit the, the specimen, there will be interaction and uh, we, there will be a secondary electron emitted and backscattered electron emitted. So the specimen current is a difference between the uh, incoming electron and outgoing electron. If the sample is conductive, of course, this uh, current will flow to the ground through the stage. So uh, the charge balance is, is reached. But if the sample is not conductive, uh, then the charge will, build, will, will, will be built up, uh, build up here and generating electrical field inside the, the specimen. And then the, this electrical field will deflect the electron beam and therefore deteriorates the image information. So charge balance may be obtained at lower voltage. So, so let's take a look. This is the uh, schematic illustration of uh, the uh, emitted electron coefficient. So both uh, secondary and backscatter as a function of beam energy. We can see there are two uh, image energy points. So, yeah, so there are two uh, en beam energies, the, the coefficient equals one. So which means incoming electron equals outgoing electron. Then the current, specimen current equals zero. So we don't need uh, the charge uh, pathway. So this table lists uh, the value of some material, the E2 value. So we want to operate at E2 because E2 is higher than E1, it's easier to, to reach. So the E2 values we can see here, they are pretty low. The highest is uh, 4.2 uh, kV. So if you look at these two images, this one taken at 10 kV, this one taken at 1 kV. So in 10 kV image, um, we can see clearly these charge uh, artifact and which is not present in the uh, image taken at 1 kV. So lower the vo voltage does help to minimize the charging. Okay, so um, let's uh, start, uh, give a summary of the low voltage imaging. So it helps to increase the surface resolution, but only if the, the chromatic aberration effect is not issue. And uh, it can help to minimize the charging effect. So if we operate the microscope around the E2, beam energy around that E2. One challenge for the low voltage imaging is chromatic uh, aberration. So we know that um, 
there is always energy spread um, for the ele electron source. So that means uh, the electrons emitted from the source don't, don't have exactly the same energy as set by the uh, accelerating voltage. So these uh, e electrons with different voltages, they will uh, focus at different planes. So the, the chromatic aberration we can see here, uh, it will increase with the source energy spread. So then the energy spread is determined by the, the electron source we use. And the, the, the chromatic aberration will increase when the energy, uh, beam energy zero, uh, E zero drops. So that means uh, with the chromatic aberration, the probe will get broadened as we drop, uh, decrease the accelerating voltage. So that's not good for high resolution. Um, this list of three electron source uh, usually used in SEM. So per, in terms of the, the energy spread, we can see the, the best one is a cold field emission down this is 0 0.3, and the, the worst is a tungsten 2.5. Okay, so this is a simulation of the first 250 electrons in the probe at the plane of the disk of least confusion. So we can see that uh, for, both, uh, for both electron source, lab six and the um, field emission, um, when the accelerating voltage decreases, this probe, uh, the electrons actually have a less tendency to, to, to land near the, the, the beam axis. So the, as a result, the probe kind of widened with the uh, skirt um, of in intensity. So in, compared with these two energy source, the, the, uh, the field emission guy is better than the uh, lab six. So actually for a uh, field emission SEM, we can get roughly two nanometer resolution, but the low voltage performance for this uh, thermionic source SEM is not so good. So that's the reason in our JOL 6060. Um, so we cannot get high resolution, uh, low voltage imaging. So even for a cold field emission gun, uh, the simulation shows when you drop the accelerating voltage below 1 kV, uh, the chromatic aberration becomes uh, significant. So now we already know if we want to reduce the chromatic aberration, we do want to have a higher accelerating voltage, uh, which means a higher and beam energy to start with. And then to reduce the SE2 effect, we do want a lower uh, beam energy, lower beam landing energy. So the possible solution here is beam deceleration. So what is beam deceleration? Um, so we apply a negative bias to the specimen stage. Then the electrons, when they leave the, the column, the pole piece, they will be decelerated. So the electrons will be decelerated when they uh, land on the uh, specimen. So the, the landing energy is reduced. The beam deceleration was developed to, uh, to improve, improve the low voltage imaging by avoiding this uh, chromatic aberration, low voltage chromatic aberration effect. Also to bypass uh, the, the technical, technical challenges uh, of building the column uh, for very low voltage operation. Okay, so the beam deceleration actually uh, do more than just uh, reducing the aberration effect. First, we will have a sharper, uh, sharper uh, probe because uh, when the beam le leaves the electron optic column, they, they are already, it is already focused, but then the, uh, the beam deceleration electrical field will act as a, a immersion converging lens. So it will uh, further focus the beam. So the probe, when the probe lands on the specimen, it's, it actually gets further focused. So it's sharper probe. And the second one is 
the electrical field uh, will bend, bend this uh, trajectory of these um, signal electrons towards the, towards the beam axis. Yeah, so it will bend the trajectory toward the beam axis. Therefore, more electrons will be uh, detected. And also, uh, we deselect, the, uh, decelerate the incoming electron, but actually we are accelerate the, the signal electron when they get out of the surface. So this will make the detector de uh, detection more efficient. So this is simulation for a thermionic source um, with, uh, with B beam deceleration and without beam deceleration. The pink one is without beam deceleration. So we can see the, the resolution is improved significantly uh, by using beam deceleration, especially below, uh, especially below this uh, 2 keV. So this, uh, again, on 4800, with beam deceleration and without beam deceleration, we can see that uh, more surface detail and uh, the, the clarity of the, the image is much better in the image with beam deceleration. So the landing energy here is only uh, 600 volts. So if we, with, without beam deceleration operated at 600 volts, we will get image like this. And with beam deceleration, we have a much clearer image. So more examples from Hitachi, uh, photo resist. So we can see with beam deceleration on, we can see clearly the ripple on the side. And uh, this is a membrane filter um, operated at landing energy at 100 volts. So by operating at the low landing energy, uh, we have the, the charge is minimized and the resolution is enhanced or maintained through using the beam deceleration. So the next topic is backscattered electron imaging. So when, as an SEM user, when we talk about S, S, the backscattered electron imaging, the first thing we think about is composition contrast. But actually there is no, uh, more than that. So the yield of backscattered electron also depends on the, 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 the cute angle of the specimen. So it also, it increased monotonic phase with the tilt angle. So that's the reason backscattered electron imaging can also give us uh, topographic contrast information. So one bonus of backscatter electron imaging is the backscatter electrons are less sensitive to the charging effect. So for backscatter electron imaging, we can get some uh, charge artifact-free image. The angular dependence of a backscattered electron. So when at zero to specimen is flat at zero tilt, we have a symmetric, uh, rotationally symmetric uh, distribution of the backscatter electron. So then the detector collection is also symmetric. But when the, the specimen tilted, uh, the distribution is asymmetric. So it's kind of turned to the normal, the, the specimen normal. And this way, the detection collection is not symmetric anymore. So um, in this case, the right side of the detector will detect fewer BSE. So that's the reason we get a topographic contrast from the BSE image. Traditional backscatter electron detectors are solid state detector. So it's placed annular uh, to the bottom of the pole piece. And normally it's, uh, there are four divided into four quadrants. So we can get the topographic image through differencing um, various detector quadrants. So get some shadow effect. So to compare these three image, this is a topographical image from backscatter electron. So we can see that the charge effect clearly seen in the secondary electron imaging uh, is not here in this topographic image. 
also there is a some composition contrast as well in this image. Okay, so the backscatter electron emitting from uh, different angles. From different angles, they carry different information. So the high angle one, which is closer to the beam axis, uh, carries more compositional uh, information, crystallinity um, information. And the low angle one, they are closer to the surface, they carry topo uh, topographic uh, information. So the FEI use uh, ring segmentation uh, annular detector to, to separate these uh, backscatter electrons emitted from different angles. So they call it concentric ring design. Uh, so this uh, directional uh, backscatter electron, concentric uh, backscatter electron detector. So there are four separate rings and these Backscatter electron emitted from different angles can be separated. So you can choose to uh, which ring to use to form the image. The inner rings, of course, will collect higher angle backscatter electron. Outer rings will collect the, the <coughs> low angle backscatter electron. So give you topographic contrast. So here, uh, uh, four images from uh, the ring A through D. So this one from ring uh, A, so you have a compositional contrast, uh, high angle, and this side is low angle. So you have a more topographic contrast. So we can also get the high resolution backscattered electron imaging. So again, look at this interaction uh, volume um, dependence on the beam energy. So it's just the same as SE2, when the interaction volume shrinks toward the surface, at a certain point, the BSE also uh, emitted from the same volume as SE1. So BSE also carries the highest resolution if you lower the beam energy uh, to a certain point. So you can get high resolution that scattered electron imaging. But there are challenges for low voltage backscatter electron imaging. First, when you drop the energy really low, then the yield, the backscatter yield, if co yield coefficient is very low. The second is the detector detection sensitivity. So the, normally the solid state detector will lose sensitivity when the incoming electron beam drops below a uh, few K EV. So the third one is detector detection efficiency. You see there are many backscatter electrons, uh, those low angles. So these low angle ones will norm easily just go undetected. So that's why we need to use the techniques we discussed earlier to, to help to do the low voltage BS uh, backscatter electron imaging, especially beam deceleration. So with the beam deceleration, we already know uh, the, the signals will be um, accelerated. The, the, the signal electrons will be accelerated. So BSE, uh, backscattered and secondary, both will be accelerated uh, towards the detector. So they will reach the detector at higher energy. So this solved the problem of the detection sensitivity. The second effect from the beam deceleration is the electrical field bends the, the trajectory of the signal electrons towards the, the axis, uh, the beam axis. So that way uh, solve the problem is a detector detection efficiency. So if you compare these two, the blue one is secondary electron imaging, the, the pink one is a backscatter electron. So without beam deceleration, these electrons go all directions. So only a small portion of backscatter electron will be detected. Once we turn on the beam deceleration, then we can detect much more backscattered electrons because of the trajectory uh, modified by this beam deceleration. One thing important is in order the, for the beam deceleration to work properly, you need to have a flat surface. Otherwise, the electrical field 
formed on the surface will uh, not be symmetric. Uh, so the electrons won't be behave, won't be able to behave the way you want. So you want a flat surface for beam deceleration. The through the lens detector we discussed earlier can also be converted for BSE signal de detection by introducing BSE conversion plates. So and also biased elect uh, electrode. So this animation kind of show you how we can switch uh, the back uh, the TLD from the secondary electron detection mode to to the backscatter electron detection mode. So you see here, we when we buy, use the bias, positive bias, then the secondary electron will get detected, get goes through the pole piece, get detected. And when we uh, switch the bias to the negative, this time the secondary electron will be rejected, repelled, and then the backscatter electron can go through the pole piece and uh, to be um, are generating SE3 and then this SE3 will be detected. So of course more complicated when you arranging these conversion plates and the biased uh, electrodes. So eventually you will be able to uh, filter the electrons based on their energy. And uh, Hitachi 4800, uh, in, we can actually choose what uh, electrons to use to form the image. So we can do low angle BSE, high angle BSE, or pure BSE, or anywhere in between. So you can mix them. The nice thing about to mix this signal is you can get a high resolution imaging with both um, composition contrast, topographic contrast, and the charge artifacts free. So here again another so this is from 4800 we use a high angle bse to form the image we can see the uh, composition contrast and then you have a uh, you see the charging artifacts clearly see in the secondary electron imaging it's not in the high angle backscattered electron imaging so we can by using low voltage imaging or, or to be exact, maybe low energy, uh, low landing beam energy backscattered electron imaging, we can get uh, high resolution backscattered uh, electrons. So this one, see the five nanometer wide is quantum wall. Wow. So a summary on BSE imaging, um, we can have a high resolution and we can also uh, have a material contrast um, information and also topographic information and also we can uh, remove the charge artifact. So the last topic is transmitted electron imaging, a stem, a stem in SEM. So when the sample gets, specimen gets really thin, uh, thinner than the interaction volume, uh, the incident beam electrons will get transmitted. So by putting a suitable detector underneath the specimen, we can use this transmitted electron to form image. And just like a, a stem in TEM, um, we can use, based on which portion of the detector we are using, we can do the uh, bright field, dark field, and the uh, high angle dark field. So this is uh, from our Helios FIP uh, SEM. So you can choose which uh, signal you want to use to form the image. So these images are from Hitachi. Um, we can see this carbon nanotube, this, this secondary electron imaging, we can see the, the surface. And the stem imaging, we can see the, 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 bead, the metal beads inside of the carbon nanotube. So that's bright field image, dark field image, and high angle dark field image. So all these can be done um, <coughs> as well as the through the lens detector and the secondary electron de detector images. So you can get this image simultaneously. Okay, so a summary, what's, uh, what is available here at MRL? So immersion lens and uh, through the lens detector, we have a 47 Hitachi 4700, 4800, 
uh, Helios um, 600i fit SEM. For beam deceleration, it is available on Hitachi 4800, Helios 600i, and the Siles 2 fit. And uh, for the DBS, directional backscattered electron uh, detection, and uh, STEM, we have it on Helios. And also, GOL 7000, 7000F has a homemade STEM detector. So yeah, so um, thank you here. Um, I hope you have got some useful information from this webinar. If you are interested in trying any of these SEM imaging techniques, uh, please contact us, the EM staff, um, for a discussion. We do welcome challenging samples so that in future when I give this talk again, I hope I can use the images more images taken here at MRL. Uh, please register for our uh, MRL webinar series. The next one is about um, XPS. And also there, there is a webinar series organized by Penn State. Uh, you can register from here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Han Hui. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, we have some, uh, a number of questions here. I'll mm -hmm. try to combine a few of them. The yeah. first one is the regarding the comparison between TLD and EPD. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is that if, when you are using TLD, is there yeah. a decrease in the signal that goes into the ETD? Uh, and also tied up to that question, can we, you comment, I think you mentioned yes, that, yeah, but if you want to yeah. add more about TLD versus ETD yes. detector, when do you use one versus the other one? Okay, yes, so absolutely, when you turn on the, when you switch on the immersion mode, the SE1, SE2 will be kind of uh, sucked into the whole piece. So uh, it, it, most of the SE1, SE2, especially you are using low working distance, they will go to the TLD, they won't go to uh, ETD. But if you switch off the immersion mode, uh, there will be SE1, SE2 coming, going to the ETD. In terms of the image, um, the difference, since the TLD picks up SE1, SE2, so it gives very, uh, give you uh, more surface detail. So it's highly surface sensitive, uh, the image uh, taken by TLD. In terms of ETD, since, since there are contributions from BSE, SE3, especially when you, if you, when you turn on the, the switch on the immersion mode, so they're kind of only SE3 and BSE. So that one will give you uh, more information um, deep down and uh, maybe a little bit uh, composition contrast as well. Okay, so next we have four questions back to back about SCE1, SCE2, and SCE3. Uh, the, the, let me go over them. One question is that is there a typical, en typical energy difference between SCE1 and SCE2? Uh, and if you can actually kind of quantify the contribution from SCE1, SCE2, SCE3. Um, SE1 and SE, well, SE1 is generated upon the incident beam electron enters uh, the specimen. And SE2 is right bef generated right before the backscatter electron leave the sample. So you see the, the incident electron gets into the, the, the specimen, they will running around, eventually get back. So that's like a different uh, position to generate SE1, SE2. And uh, since SE1, SE2, the, the emission volume and they are close to each other, so you cannot really distinguish SE1 from SE2. And SE3 is generated uh, by the backscatter electron after they get out of the surface. So these backscattered electrons are very energetic. So they will hit somewhere inside the chamber. And the, the chamber material, the parts, they, the pole piece, chamber wall, 
uh, when there is a, a coming electron a hit, so they will be generating secondary electrons as well. So SE3 are not from the specimen. Okay, one another two questions here regarding SE3. The first one is that if the SE3 is, is, is mostly from walls and metal piece, why do we even bother collecting that signal? Uh, and the other and the other question is that what factors enhance the contribution from SC3 and the BSE? Um, first one is okay, so the the BSE and the SE3 will add a huge noise to the image. And uh, if we have a very fine feature, uh, the SE1 difference will be very tiny. And this difference contributes to the image contrast, right? But if the difference is well overwhelmed by the huge noise background, then we cannot really see the difference. And then we cannot see the feature. Okay. I'm not sure about the second part. Could you repeat that again? Well, the, the second question was about like, a, 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 why do we even bother about collect if it comes mostly from walls and metal parts of the instrument? Um, it's not because we want to collect, collect. It, it just yes. collect, just, the detector just collects them because they are electrons yeah. uh, with some Move. energy, so yeah. Thank you. Moving to E2. Uh, two questions combined here is that, is there any kind of good source or reference to look up the values of U2 for different materials at low voltage? And also, can you comment on how E2 neutral charge voltage depends on the tilt angle and topography of the sample? So a reference for E2 and yeah. the, how does E2 depends on tilt angle and topography? How does, uh, you mean, what? The second one, sorry. Well, let's go for the first questions. Is okay. that a good a good book, a reference to look up values of E2? Uh, well, I I mean, Low the image. example I listed is from book, so you can check there. And also, you may be able to uh, find the SE2 by yourself um, through, um, you start with, uh, okay, so if there is a charging sample, you absolutely don't want to start with a high voltage because once the electron accumulated, the charge accumulated, you won't be able to get rid of it. So you have to start at a low voltage and then you quickly increase the magnification and leave it there for seconds and then lower the magnification. And then you can look at if it's uh, very bright, the square or dark square, that will tell you if positive charging or negative charging, like where you are on that curve. Then you can decide if you want to increase a little bit more or decrease a little bit more. So you can attempt to find the SC2 by yourself just to do some uh, experiment. Okay. Now one question about the charging effect compensation. Yeah. Uh, why we take the upper crossover to compensate for charging effect? Ah, uh, okay. So the 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 coefficient means the act, uh, outgoing electron, including secondary electron, backscatter electron. So if they equals one, um, if I I'm not sure how can I go back to yeah. So if they go and. Okay, more. Oh, there. Yeah, okay. So if we look at, you see the specimen current equals the, the difference uh, between the incoming electron, now here is one, and outgoing electron here. So when this equals one, the specimen current equals zero. So that means no charge accumulated. Okay. Uh, one more question here is about beam deceleration. Yeah. Uh, seems to be like a very good method for, uh, for like as, as, the, as the attendee says, it's a cure for all high resolution imaging. 
is there a scenario where it's actually beam acceleration is actually bad for imaging? Uh, yeah, if you have a sample very rough, you, like I mentioned earlier, so if the sample is not flat, then the, uh, the, the beam deceleration works well, only depend on the electrical field, right? Formed on the surface of the specimen. But if the surface is rough, then the electrical field formed will be not symmetric. So okay. then it, it will get worse, more aberration actually. So you see. That. Since you have your slides up there, uh, one question about slide 15. The attendee participant is wondering about in slide 15, what are the dark particles showing that slide? Do okay, you have time that, to go back to that slide, 15? Yeah, so where are we? I cannot see the number. Okay, so there's 20. 20? 15, yeah, okay. 19? 19, oh, more. Yeah, okay, so here, which one? Uh, he said about that there seems to be some dark particles there. I can't. Oh, maybe we're talking this probably some contamination or. Oh, I see. Yeah, the image is very uh, surface sensitive. Okay. Okay. If the if the attendee has specifically more question about that, I suggest he will directly uh, only about this one. And now going back to the very end, slide fifty two. There are, there's a confusion about some labeling there. I don't know if you have time to go to slide 52, that's yeah, far down yeah. there. Is it 52? Yeah, so I just- There are some labels of A and B and it was not clear what they are. Oh, okay, the rings, the segment. That's the best thing about animation. Okay, so here, 52? Yes, A and B, what do they mean? Uh, where is A and B? I don't see A and B. But... So maybe we are talking about the, the, this one. Yeah, that's if it's confusing again, we can. Yeah, maybe it. here, right? Um, I think probably, you see, there are four separate rings, four yes. separate, separate rings. So you have an inner ring like A and towards outer ring B. And then image, so this image the signal comes from the ring A, this okay. one from ring B and the C and the D. So then the backscattered electron uh, from, from this image is high angle, this one low angle, this, these two are in between. Okay. All right. Uh, maybe a f two last questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, when detecting topography, which one has the highest resolution, SE or BSE? Um, highest resolution. I think probably still SE. BSE, it's possible, but it's it's probably hard to get because uh, you you want to go very low landing energy, but when you go really low landing energy, the BSE image is harder to to get because the uh, the yield drops a lot for BSE. The secondary electron uh, emission will be. Um, even better at low voltage. Okay, final question for the time we have allocated here is this. When we put up opposite electric field to slow down the electron beam, does that anyhow interfere with the SE electron detection? For example, by disturbing the routes of the reflected electrons reflected through the detector, for example. You may interfere with the interaction between yes. Yes. Uh, yes, actually that's what we want, right? So that's the reason we apply beam deceleration so that we have a much smaller interaction volume so yes. that we have a higher resolution. Okay, I'm sure I, I missed many questions here, but I encourage everyone to contact Han Hui about that. 
we're getting tons of tons of comments here. Thank you very much for the level of detail, Hungry. Excellent presentation. Thanks again. <laughs> and uh, we encourage everyone to sign up for next week because next week we also have a monster technique, XPS, which is extremely popular everywhere. So don't forget to join us. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe. Thank again, Hungry, for this fantastic talk. And I will see you guys next week. Take care. Bye. Thank you.